What up, guys? I thought I'd play that song because um, that was what I always used to listen to back in the day in, like, I think 2010, to get myself into the mood for grinding. It just worked for me. It made me feel like a badass reg. I think I stole the concept from some video I watched one time somewhere along the line, so if you're that instructor that ever made that on whatever site, please look sue me. But yeah, it was good, because <clears throat> I used to feel like I was a regulator. You get it? Regulator. Reg. Yeah, that song is called Regulators. It's by the late Nate Dog and Warren G. It's pretty good. Check it out. Good grind music. Um, welcome back to Studying Grind. This is episode number three. And today we're going to continue on our quest to... One of my students referred to what I'm doing in this series recently as constructing a poker bible or playbook. Um, it is kind of like that, um, but it's not... It's not quite a poker playbook because that kind of, I think, implies that you can sort of reduce poker to just a, a bunch of laws and a bunch of guides for situations that you can write down in some finite terms and then know what to do and just play like a sort of program. Like you could almost write a script for every situation and you can make a computer that would just play a range in every situation. And that would be bad um, just because the computer would not be able to be in touch with all the human elements of the game, like the game flow, um, interpreting all the little things that have happened recently sort of making reads on villains that aren't like completely direct. Computer programs would study with, would struggle with that kind of approach. So, you know, it's not so much like a playbook that's like an idiot's guide to just crushing poker. It doesn't work like that, but it's what we're doing here. And you'll know this if you've seen the first two episodes, which I assume you have, if you're on number three. Um, what we're doing here is we're creating, we're fam familiarizing ourselves um, drastically with every situation that we think is important enough to look at in general. My cat just brought me up. A toy as some kind of gift. May seem to be in his good books again. We were enemies earlier, but now I've been brought this prey. Um, he seems to have forgiven me, so that's that's great. I'm happy about that. So what we're doing is familiarizing ourselves with the common spots, the ones that we think come up often enough that we really should have a good idea how to play our range in. Um, examples of these spots are like preflop when we construct three bet, four bet ranges, but also just different board textures, looking at different board textures and different positions with different widths of ranges as the aggressor, as the preflop caller, whatever you want to call those things, with or without the initiative basically, in or out of position. We're looking at a bunch of different scenarios and I've got what my student referred to as my poker bible that I've been working through. So let's continue where we left off, um, not really where we left off because we're doing a whole new thing today, but let's continue, continue along the same vein and do something similar again today. And the spot I want to look at today I've constructed a few ranges for. Um, we're going to play, of course, in the second half of this video. This is study and grind, so the grinding is going to happen. This is Sunday afternoon, so I'm hoping the games will be a bit softer. We may get some fist action today, which might actually result in us deviating a lot from our poker, poker Bible textbook plays. So I'm going to have a look at some more GTO-ish range construction for this kind of spot today, which is where we are on the flop without the initiative, and this is my... This is my book of plays, if you like, where I have all my different, as you can see, it's growing. The little tabs along the right hand side are, are growing in number, but we're still quite a way away from having anywhere near a sort of complete or near to complete preflop guide. You know, other things go on in life. You have to make time for volume for social life and that kind of thing. So this is the kind of thing that I think is going to take a while to construct. It's not something I'm going to sit down and try and make in a week. It's something that's going to be... Uh, progressive with my poker development and it's going to grow as I learn more about the game and as I play and I'm very happy for that just to just to grow gradually as I learn because you don't want to like cram way too much cramming like you do for an exam doesn't work with poker you just can't possibly um, keep maintain all the knowledge in any meaningful way so that's why I do it this way I do it slowly and gradually so today we're looking at flop without without the initiative out of position which is a spot that's really important it's a spot that these days in 2014 we're having to play a hell of a lot more and that's because people have realized that min opening the button is probably the most profitable way um, in a sort of vacuum situation with no nothing else considered or as a very general strategy with there being no other factors that would change that such as fish in the blinds or a guy who um, flats way too much or anything like that. With these kind of considerations in place, without those kind of considerations in place rather I should say, then min opening the button is basically accepted as the best way to play at least at the higher stakes. I think it's filtering down now into the small and micro stakes as well and people are starting to... I think it's like I say to all my students if you're not been opening the button like you're against regulars then you're just playing suboptimally because they play so badly about it in micros so 
I don't want to preach this too much because eventually like, it's going to catch on and this massive edge that you could all have is going to go away. But yeah, min open your button is good. So as this is happening, as people are min opening the button now, um, people are defending a lot more. This is the natural response. And this shift in the way people are playing, you could think of it as, well, why is it good to min open the button when everyone's defending a lot more? Surely then we should stop min opening the button. Well, no, because then they're going to three bet us a lot more and they're just going to go back to the way they were playing before. So this trend with everyone opening the button really wide and then people calling really wide is basically, uh, I, I would say it's a general shift towards people moving towards a more game theory optimal approach to poker and playing a more strategically sound game when you basically break poker down to its bare bones and look at what GTO might be. So this is a move towards people playing closer to GTO, basically, this min opening and calling thing. And what it's resulted in is as people are playing more solidly, um, per se, pre-flop, we're having to see a lot more flops, um, both as an opener, because we're opening a wider range and we're having to see the flop a lot more, and as a defender, because we're defending a lot more because we're getting great pot odds and we're closing the action in the big blind. So by far the most situation that goes to a flop these days is button versus big blind, perhaps it always was, but now it happens like way, way, way more than all the other situations in poker just because of the width of ranges that are being played in these two spots, both from the in position <clears throat> aggressor and the out position blind defender. So it's very important that we look at this from both sides of the coin, both as both how we're going to be c-betting, how we're going to be playing post-flop as the aggressor, and how we're going to be defending post-flop as the guy in the blinds. So, <clears throat> so why don't we have a look at the spot I want to look at today. I've done a bunch of work on a few different boards here, not as much as I'd have liked. I'm going to keep working on this. We can see we've got different textures here that I look at. Best way to do this is not to just make some general default strategy post-flop in this spot like overall it's way way too um, vastly different when all the different f textures of flop come out so what we need to do is break them up into at least sort of categories we don't need to say like the flop is 10 of clubs 7 of diamonds 3 of spades how do I play that and then how do I play 9 of clubs 6 of hearts 2 of clubs it's going to be like or let's just take 2 relatively low to medium two tone boards or 2 relatively low to medium rainbow boards these boards are going to be similar enough then we can formulate one strategy. It's just like if we are raising top here for value, then it goes from raising good 10x to raising good 9x. We raise ace-9 and king-9 instead of ace-10 and king-10 if the board's 9 high. So these are the kind of things that you should probably be looking to do if you are interested in this side of the game and if you are ready to do this kind of thing. I also want to make it clear in this series that um, this is not necessarily the most plus EV way for you to go about spending your poker study time. If you're at a lesser stage in your poker development, than someone that's playing sort of 50 or 100 NL because you're still learning the ropes and the micros. Yeah, you do want to look at this stuff gradually, start filtering it in over the long term, but what should be priority for you is covering the things in the Crusher's Checklist series, um, just your basic core skills. I'm doing a series of podcasts on this just now, making sure that you understand poker situations in a vacuum, how to assess a poker situation individually first and how to exploit your opponents in it. If you can't do that, then this kind of thing is like running before you can walk and you kind of want to... You want to get a grip on isolated situations before you branch off and start looking at the broader tree of possible situations. So the spot we're looking at today is a low two-tone unpaired board. Did you know, interesting fact of the day, that more flops are two-tone than are anything else? Why should that be? Should more flops not be rainbow? No. When the first card comes down, this is just a little bit of a detour here, but why not? And it's the 10. Let's say, let me bring up um, Poker Cruncher where I've actually got... A flop. So here we've got 10, 5, 2. So when that 10 of spades com comes down, the next card on the flop um, can be either a spade, a heart, a club, or a diamond. Sometimes it's going to be a spade, you know, like just under one in four times it's going to be a spade. Most of the time it's not going to be. Um, but then when it comes down a heart, the next card can either be a heart, a spade, or a club, or a diamond. And yes, it's slightly more likely to be either a club or a diamond than a heart or a spade, so you're going to get rainbow. But the combination of this card, both not pairing with the first one, and this card not pairing with either of these two takes the probability of it being at least two-tone to over 50%. So most boards are not rainbow. This is the, actually the most common type of board. Not that it's 10 high. It could be, you know, 10 high is not like the average kind of board. Obviously, most boards are higher than 10 high. Um, but still, 10 high, two-tone boards are pretty damn common. Good place to start. And, you know, we can compare this board. It's similar to a board like Jack. 6-3 with two hearts or two clubs or whatever or 9-5-4. It's not too different. So we're going to take these as one kind of situation basically. So on this board, um, I am looking at some ranges for me when I'm in a big blind. How should Hero play 
having defended the blind. Well, the first thing to think about for Hero here is what kind of range is he defending? What kind of range should he be defending against the average regular? Again, don't waste your time by looking at this spot and what and think about what kind of range you're going to play against a fish here or a net. You don't really need to do that because you can just sort of like deviate massively from this and just play every spot almost like it's a vacuum or in some spaces like it is a vacuum. We don't really care what we're doing with the rest of our range because every time we're in a spot with X hand it's just so plus EV and obviously so to just do something on max with that hand like always and every similar type of hand. Like for instance, if we're against a fish, there's no way we don't want to like raise the flop for value. We don't care about balancing any calling range there. It's just ludicrous. We don't give a shit. We just want to get more money in the pot now while the fish is, you know, not going to be folding. And we can build a pot, etc, etc. Against a net, we want to be bluffing a lot. That's just, we don't care that we're going to be really unbalanced there because we think the net's going to fold. So we can just look to bluff with all the hands that have any kind of equity or something like that. Not to say any two cards, but... So this is against regulars, as always in this series, when we study, we look at situations that we can play, how to form ranges against regs so that we're playing optimally against the general um, population reads. So what are the general population reads I have at my stakes? Of course, your stakes will be different. Don't copy my ranges. Think about it in terms of your own, your own games and how people are playing there. How can you adjust, make ranges that are adjusting to your population, not just you know, a default population that you've seen someone make a video on, think about your own pl your players at your own stakes, obviously. And on your own site, that's going to be important too. But on my site, on my stakes, which as you know by now is 100s of stars at the minute, um, I think the people open seriously wide for the, on the button. The men open most of the time, so this is going to be against the men open. It's the most common spot. You can do one of these against other sizings, if other sizings are also prominent. But for me, men opening is like 85, 90% of regulars game here. So that's why I'm looking at that first. Um, so yeah, I'm basically, what I've done here is I've chosen a range that I'm going to be calling out the big blind. You can see that there's obviously hands at the top here, which are going to be my 3-bet for value range. Now you might say, what what the hell kind of like polarized 3 bank range are you playing here? Is your bluffing range like as weak as this? If you remember the spectrum, you'll remember that we have a 3-bet value range, then we have a calling range, then we have a 3-bet bluff range, then we have a folding range, so it's this sort of spectrum of four different strengths of ranges ranging from the nuts to the stuff we just can't play in the first place we can't even bluff with it. it's too weak so what's going on here why does there seem to be like no gap here a massive massive gap here well as you've seen before if you see the way i play live you'll see that i flip a coin sometimes on my screen which seems kind of like funny or ridiculous but i think it's the optimal way for me to play in this spot um and basically i am three bit bluffing at some of these hands basically the suited aces the suited connectors the things that i'm always preaching about how they make the best choices for three bit bluffs um i'm three bit bluffing those hands a decent amount of the time here half the time basically because i'm flipping a coin and there are weaker hands here that i'm just always flatting because i think they're too weak to use as three bit bluffs which kind of betrays the logic of the spectrum but it's okay because like when you've got men open you can just afford to defend so wide but you do need to also be careful that your 3-bet bluff range doesn't become like ridiculously weak. Like if I made this my calling range because I thought I could flat every one of these hands and be plus EV, then I'd have to be bluffing with like 10-5 suited if I followed the preachings of the spectrum in every situation, including this one. I'd have to bluff like all these crappy hands here and maybe some offsuit junk. I just don't want to do that because my opponent's defending fairly wide. That's another, another read I have here is that my opponent will probably call like fairly wide here. So that said, this range is actually like a bit lower, too polarized. I should probably like be adding a few more of these hands into my three-bit range as well, the like case queen, king, queen, ace, jack, etc. But anyway, that aside for now, um, you can I can change that if I decide that people are definitely flatting too much or whatever, um, or a lot. So this is my defend range. Sometimes I three-bit some of these hands. I'm not too concerned with that for now because most of the hands I three-bit here aren't going to feature too heavily in the post-flop analysis, and we'll see why. In just a minute. So this is my calling range. So now we're gonna. This is the range I see this flop of ten five two. This two hearts with. I see the flop with all of these hands with six hundred eighty combos. I see it with you know more than half of the possible whole card combos. So if any my blinds here fifty one point three percent of the time, and I'm three betting some other percent for value as well. So realistically, I'm only folding my blinds here like forty five percent or something. Which is optimal. So when your opponent's men opening the button and you're folding seventy percent, you're playing pretty horribly. And that's what people do at 10 and L or whatever, and that's why you should min open the button at 10 and L, because you can just exploit this massive leak in the population, in my opinion. So, so anyway, we defend wide, as I believe we should. Then we see the flop. And we now need to decide what kind of range are we going to check raise on the flop. I'm looking at check raising here. 
There are hands we're going to be check calling as well, obviously. Hands with more showdown value. Draws we don't want to get blown off of by getting 3-bet. Um, hands that have showdown value and are fairly strong but are not quite strong enough to raise for value and play against villains continuing range to a raise. This kind of thing. Like weakest or mediumish top pairs, um, under pairs, random, any one pair basically, any sort of backdoor good over cards, backdoor race high, showdown value kind of hand. These kind of things are all going to be like calling hands that we can expect to get to showdown when with often enough or at least win the pot in some other way and have showdown value if we need it. Um, so yeah, that's going to be good for us for sure um, to first decide which hands we're calling and then not turn them into raises because that would be really bad. So I've kind of done that um, already in my head and I'll show you guys that will become evident when we look at my raising range. So I've got two raising ranges here. I've got one that is a range that I am not folding if I get three bet in the flop. I'm basically ripping it in with or at least calling or calling with depending. Um, and then I've got another range that I'm going to be check raise folding on the flop which is basically going to be weaker. They're not going to be hands with as much equity. It's not going to be a crying shame if I have to fold them on the flop. So let's look at the first one. Now, this is the range that I'm going to raise with and jam over a 3-bit. Obviously, there's much more to the hand than that because there are loads of times. Most of the time, my opponent continues. He's not going to 3-bit me. He's going to float me or he's going to call with a stronger hand or whatever. So, yeah, but it's important that I do think that people do like to bluff 3-bit these flops quite a bit. Um, especially a board like this where I don't rep very many value combos, like what the hell do I have here, I have fives and deuces for value, that's all I'm perceived to have, which is why I widen my value range a bit more here, as well as 3-bet my strong draws, uh, check raise my strong draws that I can then shove over a 3-bet. Very quick myth buster, um, one of the um, terminology leaks a lot of my students have is that they refer to a raise on the flop, as in like a check raise on the flop as a 3-bet, it's not, um, it's a raise, it's like a 2-bet. Basically, preflop, the blinds are in there already, so that counts as the first bet. Then there's the open, then there's the third bet, that's the re-raise. That's why we call that a three-bet preflop. On the flop, we do not call a raise a three-bet, we call that a check raise. Then, when the person puts in the third raise on the flop with the third bet, that's the three-bet. So, a little bit different, a little bit confusing. It's to do with the blinds not being in there. Just thought I'd clear that up so you guys aren't terminology fish, because what's more embarrassing, right, than being a terminology fish? I'm only joking, it doesn't really matter, but I thought I would just throw that out there. So, so this range here... Is stuff we check raise with and then we jam should our opponent 3-bet. And it's nice to have a range here that if I think my opponents are going to be 3-bet bluffing me a bunch on this board, which I think that they probably are, 100 NL is aggressive these days, most regs are going to look at this flop and they're either going to float me or they're going to mess with me quite a bit here. Because when I check raise it, they kind of think, okay, my opponent's range is like almost nothing for value. He's 3-betting all his over pairs pre-flop. He's not raising like top pair here. So I'm just going to not fold, basically. And they're going to, I think that they're going to over-adjust and they're going to continue too much to my check raise, which is why I've made my range, I've made sure that my range continues to a 3-bet enough of the time and it's relatively strong here for check raising, although it does con contain a lot of bluffs as well, which we want to have because our opponent's c-betting a wide range. So again, we're finding this balance between being able to attack our opponent's weak range and not doing it so massively exploitably that he can kill us by never folding. So that's the kind of balance we're aiming at here. And that's important. So what have we got here? Let's start at the top. We've got the nuts, right? We don't have 10s because I'm 3-betting 10s pre-flop in this situation for sure. So I want to rip them over my opponent's 4-bets. People have started the 4-bet call, things like 6s, 7s, 8s, 9s these days. So I definitely want 10s in my 3-bet jam range, given that's the way the games are progressing. I think that's kind of horrible to 4-bet call 6s against me, but they may not know what my ranges are. And there are people who 3-bet jam the likes of 4s, 3s, and deuces, which I think is just really bad these days when people are 4-bet calling off a lot wider in these games. Be totally different again at your stakes. This is something that applies to my games, probably not yours. So don't take everything literally and transfer it, because you can. So we've got these sets. We don't have 10s. So we've got these six combos of sets here. Very thin value range, if that's all it is. And that's why my opponent is likely to not want to fold very much here. And fair play to him. Who can blame him for not wanting to fold to a value range of six combos out of 680, right? That I see the flop with. I hardly ever have a set. So, given that I have a set like 1% of the time or something on this flop, how the hell can I make sure that I actually have a range here that is capable of being somewhat balanced, given that I want to bluff some amount? So, these hands here are all hands that if my opponent decides to 3-bet me, I'm going to rip them over in his face and he's going to have to fold all his bluffs and just burn a load of dead money. So let's move up. I've got um, Ace-10 and King-10 which are like my good top pairs. I probably don't like shove these over uh, a 3-bet. Uh, 
Yeah, three bet. I'd probably just flat them because it doesn't really make any sense if my opponent's bluffing a lot. I mean, it might not be terrible if the board was wether or something. You can have loads of draws, but I think that most people just flat their mediocre draws here. They're not like three bet folding them because that's kind of horrible and position is just awful actually. Um, so I don't think people are really doing that. I think that when I get three bet here, it's a weaker range. It's like bluffy kind of stuff or it's the nuts. So I kind of like, or it's like some really good draw that has loads of equity against me anyway. So I like to call my ace 10, king 10 hands here to a raise usually. Which of course leaves my range like solely ace 10 or king 10 on the turn if my opponent wants to try and barrel me. That is exactly what my range is. In theory, he should be able to play against it very easily, but he doesn't know that. He's not going to know what my range is, so I'm okay with that. Um, I don't. I think that's like by the time you start getting to the turn there and you get into this very unique rare situation where I've been 3-bet and I've flatted it, flatted it out of position, it's just probably rare enough that it doesn't really matter that my range is just one thing because it's my opponent's really not going to know that and it's going to take a very long time for him to use that information and for that to hurt my EV in the long run. So I think it's okay. And I can just like not fold as well if I, depending how aggressive my opponent is. But I, anyway, most people are going to be like three betting this flop and then like giving up if they get floated, which kind of opens the door. Do I actually want to float some other hands as well? When I get three bet here, maybe I do. I haven't looked into that yet. I've just made like a foundation of this. I'm going to see how it goes and then come back to that. So anyway, I've got here these hands I'm going to raise for value and then probably just continue to a three bet. Definitely not going to fold them anyway. And then I've got these hands here. Now the sort of sickly green puke color here um, actually represents that only one suit has been chosen. Um, for example, here we have hearts, ace, deuce, ace, three, and ace, four of hearts. We have what's called the combo draw, we have a flush draw with a straight draw and an overcard. We have absolutely heaps of equity against almost everything my opponent can have, apart from maybe sets. And so I can three bet these hands and actually look to get all the money in as well when I've done so. So that's pretty nifty for me, that's pretty cool. Um, I can use these hands as sort of swords that I can 3-bet and then ship with. I don't need to be folding or anything like that when I get 3-bet. Um, then I've got the other hands of this kind of ilk, which are pair plus draw hands. So I've got my suited tens here that have a flush draw. 10x of hearts, basically. Again, these are combo draws that have an absolute load of equity against an overpair, a likely hand that my opponent might 3-bet call with here, like kings. You know, I just, I'm like a slight favourite or something, so it's just really good. That's awesome. And then I've got um, I've got some really strong nut flush draws with two overs, of like ace-queen and ace-jack of hearts. You'll notice that I have a lot more flush draws in my range here than the ones I've chosen to check raise, and that's because the other ones, they're a lot weaker, and if I get three bet, I'm not so comfortable like shipping them over because they just don't have as much equity against my opponent's three bet call offering. So that kind of sucks for me, and I definitely don't want to three bet fold those hands because that really sucks for me. Um, to put a bunch of money into the pot with loads of equity and then just relinquish the whole pot and all my equity at once. That's just really, really bad and just unsound from a strategic point of view. So I don't want to be like raise folding the weaker draws. That's why they're in my calling range. I've got these strong draws in here. It's important to have these draws because for one, I'm able to play back against three bets more. I'm able to shove and stop my opponent exploiting me by three betting my otherwise bluff heavy range, right? And secondly, um, I am not always weak when I check raise the flop and then a flush card comes in the turn. If I didn't have any flush draws there, then my opponent would have flushes a fair amount and I would never have flushes and that would just suck for me and my range would just be getting killed. So to balance things a little bit more, these hands are in there for those two reasons. So this is the range that I continue with. You can see here with lovely Poker Cruncher, it tells us how many combos that is. It's 55, which is cool. So we've got 55 combos, not very much out of the original sample, but that's okay. Even if we end up folding on this kind of board to a C-bet like a fair amount, that's not going to be a big problem because our pot odds are so good. The very thing that allows us to defend in the first place in this spot is that our pot odds are really awesome. So that's cool. Okay, so that's going to be the range that we raise with that's kind of half value, half really strong draws. It's just like a really good range. Um, I have to pause the video for a split second here because I'm getting called, basically. Ah, uh, girlfriends always calling you when they know you're making a video just to ask why I went for dinner. You know, hard life, tough times. So, so basically here, this isn't that many combos, but that's okay because we are getting such a good price that we can even afford to check fold the majority of the time post-flop, and it's not a big deal as long as, you know, we're getting like three and a half to one 
pre-flop, we don't need to win the pot very often, and we don't need to we don't need to do so well there. Basically, we just need to do better than like losing the big blind that we'd lose anyway, and that shouldn't be too difficult to do as long as we're not defending on like absolutely everything or playing really badly post-flop. So let's look at this range now as well, which is the check race folding range. So this is basically the bluff range. Oh, just very quickly here, there are a few other hands here that I didn't quite cover. Um, I've also got... Oh no, that's everything, isn't it? Yeah, combo draws, blah blah blah, yeah. So, in this range, we've got some backdoor draws. <clears throat> Mainly this is going to be made up with backdoor draws. I don't want to raise better draws than that, because basically I just don't want to have to fold them when I get 3-bet here. It's just not very nice. Um, there are some other hands actually that I've missed out here that I could add to this range, like some other gut shots. We'll get to that in a minute. So let's start off with these hands here. So these are the Ace of Hearts, which is the backdoor flush draw, which is a really useful card to check raise here because for one, it blocks my opponent having it. And when he has the Ace of Hearts, he just doesn't fold that much because, like I said before, people tend to disbelieve three bets in this spot pretty often. I'm um, sorry, check raises in this flop. I'm just doing what I criticized earlier calling it a 3-bit. Um, they tend not to believe check raises here because, like we saw, Hero only has 6 combos of sets, so he's basically perceived to be full of shit here quite a lot. So when they have the Ace of Hearts, not only do they have a flush draw with that, and they're not flush draw a fair amount, which will get 3-bit on the flop, and it'll just be bad because my opponent will just like be able to destroy me when he has the not flush draw here, overall. Um, when he doesn't have, when he just has the not backdoor flush draw, he'll also be looking to not fold a fair amount. So when I have the Ace of Hearts, it's a really nice spot for me to check raise, not just because it helps my own equity and my own barrel prospects, but because it blocks the hell out of villains continuing range as well. That's just really nice, um, and I like to be able to do that. It also means on the turn and stuff, when it turns a heart, villain can never have the nut flush, and I can. Um, and it means that he'll just be folding a bunch more because he just doesn't have the nut flush or the nut flush draw on the turn. So not only does it help my fold equity on the flop for blocking his continuing range, it also helps me on the turn as well. There's a nice little trick here about having these backdoor draws in your range. So I've chosen all the backdoor draws that don't have that much showdown value. If I have like ace, jack, ace, queen here, I can just call. I don't need to make that hand like a check raise because I think it's profitable to call. These hands, however, I don't think they're so profitable to call. So I'm going a bit more polarized here and I'm like flatting this up with showdown value. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like the spectrum, but like the concept's taken and moved to post flop. And then I'm like attacking here with the hands that are a bit weaker. And you'll note that I'm not attacking with like strong or medium draws because I do not want to have to fold them like I said before. That's why I'm not taking a hand like 9-8 of hearts here and check raising it. I'd much rather just call with that hand, have that part of my calling range. That way I can have a bunch of flushes when the turn's a heart and my opponent barrels like hell with the nut flush draw and all that kind of stuff that he's got all the time there. I don't need to worry about it because I've got flushes in my range. So I definitely want a bunch of flushes in my calling range here. Otherwise we just get destroyed on these two turn two turn runouts when it comes to flush card on the turn, and that's not good because that's almost a quarter of the time we get killed there. So it's nice for us not to raise those hands. So we've got our weaker stuff here <clears throat> as well. Um, this king-queen offsuit hand is again with the king of hearts, king-jack offsuit with the king of hearts, the second nut flush draw. Again, it helps block a bit of villain's continuing range. The king of hearts is another card that won't be, it's not quite as important as the ace. He'll relinquish it a lot more than he will like back to a flush draw with the ace of hearts, but it helps again because he will look to play back when he has like a high backdoor flush draw here some of the time. So it's pretty nice for us to block those as well. Queen Jack of Hearts and King Jack of Hearts and King Queen of Hearts as well. It's good to know all have straight draws, backdoor straight draws. Queen Jack off has more, um, has a, a wrap, three card wrap, which is fairly pathetic. And no limit hold them in terms of absolute equity, but it's nice in terms of the options it gives you on the turn. So that's why that hand makes it in there. These suited hands are not heart hands because like I said before, a hand like King Queen suited, I'm not quite happy like jamming that all in. It's probably okay. I could have that in my three bet jam the flop range. It wouldn't be a disaster or anything. It's all right. But I like to call when that hand is hearts. And in this case, I'm three bet. I'm raising when it's spades here. I can also make a spade flush by the river here. I have a backdoor spade draw. And it's even like less obvious when when it comes down spade spade, which is nice and helps our implied odds sometimes against the top of villain's range. Um, and yeah, I can use these hands basically as bluffs. They're a bit too weak for me to flat, but they're like the best by their spade draws. They have over cards, by their straight draws. There's a lot of good turns basically when I have this kind of hand. These are probably the weakest part of my check race folding range here. King nine, queen nine, and jack nine of spades. So 
<clears throat> I mentioned before that there were some other hands here that I think I can add to my range as well. When I say other hands, I mean stuff like 6-4 suited. Um, yeah, that's probably about it, actually. Um, when I have like just a gut shot, I have ace high, and I don't have the backdoor flush draw, I'm probably just going to be, I'm going to be just calling. Because I think like, I don't want to be like raising way too much here, and I think when I have ace high, I still have enough showdown value against villains, very weak range, so I can make it to showdown some of the time. Um, so this strategy is pretty cool. There's one major flaw with it, and it's not even like a big deal. It's just the biggest flaw with the strategy, and that's that my calling range is very weak. But the way I see this kind of spot is that when you play this wide of a range and the flop comes 10-5 deuce, it's just the fact that because you 3-bet your strong stuff, you don't have the nuts here very often. There's nothing you can do about that. And I don't believe that turning all your nut hands into slow plays is going to be the best way to compensate for that. Even if you make pocket twos and pocket fives part of your calling range here to like protect all your other hands, guess what? There's still gonna be like a tiny part of the range you call in the flop. All your random suited cards that have made like top pair or second pair here or an under pair or something are gonna vastly outweigh your sets here. So making your sets part of your calling range is just the wrong way to go about this in my opinion because not only do you not do like a massive amount of difference for your calling range it's still fundamentally very weak it's just a little bit stronger like if your range is mostly weak top pair and second pair by like a nine or ten to one ratio when you get to the river villain's not going to say oh i better not bluff this river a lot because he has sets very very rarely if he's good he shouldn't think like that anyway he should just still continue to abuse your range so sets here really make a bigger difference to the raising range they bolster that a lot more and raising a set is just the best way to play it because you just get way more money into the pot and you can actually stack your opponent like way more often than you can by calling and letting the board run out as it wishes and then giving him the option to play his position and check back as you've not seized the initiative. So a set here really I think needs to be in your raising range if you have one which you should um, because the main thing is that it forms a much more significant part of a range of 55 or in total here like 88 combos it forms a way more significant part of that with its measly six combos than it does of your calling range because off top pair here you're probably going to have like or not just top pair second pair your ace highs your gut shots the things that can afford to call here your flush draws it's going to form a really tiny part of that range it's not going to do a good job of bolstering something that's so vast it's like if you have an army of like a million soldiers and you put like a strong amazing warrior into it it's not really going to mean anything if it's a million against a million that warrior is not going to do like so much for your for your battle there however if you're fighting like five on five and you throw a beasting warrior into the equation it's going to make a big difference right so that's why i think it needs to be part of your raising range it's kind of a weird concept but i think it's true um so yeah the one flaw that people could criticize about the strategy i don't believe it is like we have a very weak calling range anyway here when we flat build c bet on the flop so the fact that we are not calling our sets there to balance, I don't really think it matters. Um, we just have to deal with it. We have a weak range there. There's nothing we can do about that as, ne as necessary from the way that we should be playing pre-flop. So let's just suck it up and deal with it rather than making stupid over adjustments like slow playing sets here all the time. It's just dumb, in my opinion. But anyway, people will disagree with that. That's something I've been thinking a lot about recently. I feel kind of strongly about it. Anyway. That's the end of part one. Um, these are my ranges in this spot for now, and this similar and similar kinds of spots with similar board textures. Um, button versus big blind. If you play 100 NL, please don't take note of these and then find a counter strategy because that would just be like unfair. I'm trying to help people by making these videos, so don't exploit me. Just pretend you never watched it and forget what my ranges are if we play against each other. Okay, great. Let's go into part two. Um, I'll pause the video, I'll fire up some tables, we'll do some Sunday grinding and maybe we'll play against some fish and not even need to use any of this, but maybe we will. So, stay tuned. So guys, I'm back for part two. Um, not so much has happened, I've just started up four tables. We do have a couple of what look to be fish lurking about the place. Got one here in the big blind on table one. Um, one thing I did when I sat down on table two was I made sure I got right on the left of that guy there. And the most important thing you can do is if you see a guy who doesn't have 100 bigs, who you don't have tagged as a shorty regular, you just need to jump on their left like as soon as possible. If there are like multiple seats, like being their left is just so important because you're in a position where you can isolate like all their limps and just make life really difficult for them. Um, so here I have King Jack off. This is a hand that could be part of my um, four bit range. I don't think I've actually, have I made a four bit range for this kind of position? I don't really think I have. Um, 
but generally here I'll be four betting like some percent of the time. It doesn't really matter if I four bet this hand or not in this occasion. Um, I just want to be playing like a range here, like enough combos of four bit bluffs. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and fold. But yeah, because um, I don't I don't know anything and it's Sunday, which just makes it a little bit more likely that someone I've not played with before is not a regular. I mean, he probably is, but it's a bit less likely than usual. So we'll just like confirm that before we go like four bit bluffing, I think. Um, Jack nine here is kind of like close. This is definitely like as long as you don't fold this spot, like you're doing okay on table four. Um, you can three bet this spot or you can flat. I do have a fish behind me. I'm going to flat because I have this shorty behind me. I don't mind playing like a multiway pot here with this guy at all. Um, this is going to be part of the range that I'm just going to flat with here in position. Reason being that it's one of the draws that we talked about in the first part, which is actually pretty relevant here. It's not strong enough that we want to like raise and get it all in here. Um, because our equity is just not that great, we can be dominated by stronger draws, or we can just be like, we just not, don't have any overcards when he has an ace queen or something like that. Um, so we just flat here in position, pretty standard. We turn more equity, so we're definitely going to be um, calling again there in the turn and looking to bluff rivers if he shuts down. That's played my sizing here when I've got like, I don't have too much air in my range here, um, which means that. Like, my range is, like, really quite strong on this kind of turn card. I don't need to bet, like, massive here. I'll just bet, like, a standard size. Villain's going to have a very hard time, like, continuing here anyway. Um, and I have a lot of value in my range here. So my range probably doesn't want to be, like, sizing this absolutely massively or anything. That turn hits me pretty well. Ace, deuce, suit, off suit. I'm not going to be defending against this guy. I would leave this table because I just don't like having, like, rampant three betters on my left if I can help it. But... That card is like horrible for me to bluff. I mean, I could consider like over betting here. Do I want a bluff range? I just feel like, well, it's not horrible actually to just bet this river really big. But my fear is that Villa just has like a queen like really, really often. Bet like four here, this starts building the pot on table two enough to be able to ship. Let me think about this on table four. Um, he can have hands like eight, nine, like flush draw plus pair. These kind of hands are probably folding now. He does have a bunch of queen X as well. Um, Yeah, okay. I'm not over bet because I think like I can make him fold Queen X sometimes here. Like weak Queen X. Definitely think it's possible and I think I'd definitely get him to fold like all his hands such as and like this is a good all his hands like just pair plus draw should definitely fold to this size. Table one I can three bet, I can defend. It's not like such a big deal what I do here. I just make this part of my bluffing range because he's 3x, so my calling range should be a bit a bit smaller. He's going into the tank, which makes me think like Queen X is like more common a part of his range here. Yeah, so we almost get him to fold Queen 9, which is pro probably means our line is like fairly good, I guess. We need folds. Just over half the time there. Um, it's good to know that he sort of tanks at hand, I guess. But it's a good sizing. Like, if we are bluffing there, we, we should have some bluffing range there, I think. Um, and I think that our value range there can be betting really big as well. Just because, yeah, we're going to like either have pretty much the nuts there, like good trips because we're not flatting like raggy queens there. So we're gonna have like good trips. It's gonna be like the bottom of our value range. Our value range is gonna be really strong there, but we do have like a bunch of bluffs, like draws that haven't quite got there yet. So I think it's good to have just large sizing there in general. Like we want villain to fold a bunch, but our hands are like super strong for value. It's not like we have any thin value in our range and need to be like making it less because of that. Um, now he's seen me do that. Like he's definitely gonna be less likely to fold against me in future. I make like a session note here where I use a different symbol um, just so I know that like if I play this guy in like three weeks this may may not be relevant but just for now I can I can say this seen me over bet bluff river. I think it's like a spot where most people at these stakes don't tend to fire a bluff very often there. They tend to like auto give up and that might be for good reason because people just never fold Queen X. Um, and if he's playing like some kind of GTO strategy, of course he shouldn't fold Queen X there. But I think like when I just have no showdown value and he can have a bunch of 
non queen x hands there like you can definitely check all that turn with like pair plus flush draw hands even just stuff like nines or tens can definitely be in his range for check calling that turn it can be a sizable part of his range as well um so i think we definitely get folds he doesn't have a queen i don't mind my line like i think it's okay um i need to decide like what size of bluffing range i guess that i have in that spot um but and then I can assign like what combos I bluff with there, but I don't have like so many floats on that flop. Like I said, on the turn, um, my range is pretty strong. And um, this is kind of like an annoying spot where we get raised on this board by what seems to be a loose fish. We get power min raised, which is always a bit scary when we bet like pretty big. I'm going to start off by just like folding this spot. Um, I've got like a marginal bluff catcher and he's power men raised a pretty dangerous board. It could turn out that we can fold there if he ends up being like really, really loose aggressive and just like attacking everything. But for now, I think it's pretty spewy to be. I mean, we could peel one there and then shut down the turn. That wouldn't be like a bad strategy either. Um, but I think it's the kind of board texture that a fish is going to be, be able to connect with like quite a lot and have a bunch of value hands there. So I think folding is definitely good. I'm going to continue like my strategy of just flatting a bit wider here. We don't have anyone that's like squeezing shit loads or anything speak of the devil he just goes ahead and squeezes as i say that but we don't have anyone like squeezing loads he's only got an eight percent three bet and this guy is we want to play pots with him with these kind of hands and a multi-way pot so i think that's fine we fall to the squeeze here we don't really have a hand that's quite strong enough to flat with i don't think unless he's got a higher squeeze percentage and i don't think it's because his squeeze percentage is a little bit low, I don't think that we were able to ship over there. If we had like a hand like pocket nines or something, I think we could definitely find a profitable ship there. And maybe in a future video, I'll go into how much equity um, we actually need in order to do that. I'm gonna check raises flop because I just check a bunch of my range here and villain stabs a bunch of his range here. That's generally what happens. I check my value hands here as well, a lot of them. Um, like strong hands like over pairs and sets here I'm definitely going to be checking as well as well as like really good combo draws like queen x of diamonds I'm going to be check raising all that kind of stuff and I'll make this about like 14.50 I think is about right so I've got one of these back throw draws it's not like got enough showdown value for me to call down I do have like back throw flush draws and straight draws which is fairly nice um here I'm just going to bet like if people want to just like check fold this board a lot i think i just bet here and find out like i don't get to show down enough on table four by just checking for his back there even though it is the case that like all the better hands call and all the worst hands fold that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean that we should never bluff here because i think that, that yeah we just need to basically pick up the pot because if villains check folding here like half the time or more than half the time it's just a travesty if we're not like picking up the pot basically but yeah, check raising flops is pre-flop raiser is like one of my new favorite things to do. A lot of my preconceived ranges, I full king jack here because we have like some three betters ahead. And I'm going to change this guy to a non-short stack. I think he's changed his game since then. And we don't have any fish or anything. So king jack's like one of those borderline hands I may or may not open depending depending on who's at the table. Um, so yeah, when we check raise the flop there, it's just really nice because we just protect all the hands we want to check fold. One big mistake that people make in this spot with their strategy, I think, is that they c bet way too much. And they start auto c betting this board, and they do get killed because their opponent's range is stronger than theirs is, and their opponent has position, and it's a board their opponent connects with like fairly well. Um, so when we c bet there, our opponent can make life very difficult by applying a strategy of just folding very, very little. Um, and I don't like firing like big c bets that make his floats like more costly or anything like that because it's just bad for a whole range. With ace queen here. Um, against, I, I just see about this board like all day. I don't have like I could check back here and then call turns, but I prefer just like adding this hand to my see about range. It's just like super strong on so many turns, and it's a good one to turn into a bluff on a lot of runouts. So I like to I like to just see about it, and I can call a check raise there like really happily because I have decent equity against his range. I think he's I'm just ahead loads on that board, so I'm not gonna bet fold that flop with ace queen back throw draw there. Sixes, we can defend, and it's strong enough from the big blind when we're closing the action. And on this kind of board, this is very similar to the kind of board we looked at in training at base camp. The only difference is that we have a bunch of... I'm going to go for a check raise on this turn. Like, I'm going to check raise bluff this turn a bunch as well. And I think that it's a spot where, because villain's range is capped, we definitely do want to be check raise bluffing loads. 
Um, now, I feel like I just don't ever get called by a worse hand, so I just check raise again. He's going to bet Queen X here. He's not going to bet, like, much else. Um, it's kind of, like, gross when we just go to showdown there, but, like, we're not going to... I mean, I think his check on the flop's just really bad there with this three. Uh, I think he just should be C-betting a hand that's three high that has some equity, like, for sure. Um, but against that part of his range, we're not making any money by betting either. We're making money by getting him to stab at some point, and when he has a hand that can call a bet, like when he has a hand like, he doesn't have jack x when he checks the flop and turn. Um, so when he has a queen, um, he's going to, maybe 9x is one hand we can get called die that doesn't bet. But most of his range is either going to be air or queen x there. I'm going to keep c-betting big. I've only c-bet big against this guy so far. Um, so, yeah, we get raised here. I'm definitely like not folding this time. I'm going to elect to actually 3-bet because I think... By 3 betting small here, I can set up like a nice turn shove. I just need to figure out how big I want to make it. If I make it like 31, there's going to be 67 in there, and yeah, that's going to be easily shovable. So I'll just make it like 31 here. I'm calling a ship. I'm shoving turns, basically. I am um, have to fold here. This is like a crappy turn for me, but I think that I just have to shove it. I don't really see what else I can do. Um, I could, it is like a really bad turn, like a lot of villains range gets there, but I think he's like a spazzy fish with just a bunch of like 7s, 8s, 9s and stuff that won't fold. It's kind of close, but I think like we still have to shove here. Okay, so he has 6s, but we could consider like maybe checking back turn and then shoving river, uh, but I don't think villain has any bluffs in his range, so like bluff catching there doesn't really make a lot of sense, and I think we just have way better equity by shoving turn now than we do by shoving river on like an overcard um, when villain calls or anything like that. I think like we're, our equity is maximized against his range um, on that turn before the board gets much worse for us basically. So yeah, definitely got like a depolarized range for raising the flop when he calls there which leaves a lot of sort of a7, a8, 9s, all that kind of thing in his range. Um, unfortunately, he does have like a bunch of like 6x there. That's why that turn card sucks so much. But I don't really, I don't think there's too much we can do about that against like someone who's clearly a pretty big fish. So just make a note here that this guy has a depolarized flop raising range. And it's great to play against guys like that because when you have like top pair or an over pair you can just play it so fast because they just have this range that's just shoveling money into the pot um, basically never folding. This is a spot where you can definitely open ace deuce off suit in the cutoff because the button is like fairly tight, he's not 3 bet. if this is a button that's going to punish me for opening up my cutoff range then I don't open it, but I've got two blinds who don't 3 bet very much and the button is tight, so definitely an open. And that's one thing you should look out for is spots where you can just open up your range a lot. Easy C button the flop. Um, when he leads here I think easy raise as well probably. Um, we can just call and keep this, range, keep this hand in our calling range, it's kind of nice to have the nut flush draw here. But when we have a pair as well, we block sets and stuff like that. Um, not all turn cards are great for us. We can definitely call twice here on like any any run out though. This is like kind of close. Yeah, I think I think we just call here. Like we have like showdown value. We can call any turn. Um, I'm gonna make a weird cold call with sevens here just because we've got fish who can come behind. We're getting like a three way pot. That's just pretty nice. Um, Usually I check back this turn, I mean I don't really think he's check folding a better hand ever, so there's not much sense in, in betting. Um, and then we'll just go to showdown here. Okay, so he's like leading middle pair there, that's a little bit strange. I wonder if he's like lead folding it. For the nuts on table 4. Um, so I think check call here is like the only option, like it's just... Check raising is just so bizarre, like it's almost like it's so absurd that it just has to be the nuts every single time. Like maybe make him fold like aces or something. Um, but yeah, check call here is like definitely the way to go because it's how we play tens, it's how we play jacks, it's how we play nines. All of these hands play in the same way and raising here is just like insanely scary now. So I think we just check call and 
yeah, our range looks super, super strong here, unfortunately. But I think that's there's not really much we can do about that. We can't exactly like make our range look weak by folding sevens and still expect to win the hand. So that's just one of those things. And now, like when villain has like aces or queens, series definitely like going into check fold now, check fold mode when he gets called twice, I think. Um, so it gets checked through. Again, like it's very hard for us to rep any air here at all. Like it's it's almost impossible. Like now we either have like tens full or whatever. Like I don't know. Like can we even get called by pocket aces by making a small bet here? I don't really. S unless villain's like really bad and can't hand read. I don't think so. I think we just have to rip and try and target like Ace King and just hope that people don't fold Ace King in this situation. Um, we get two insta folds. So I don't think we made a King fold there. I don't know. I'm just guessing that like I'm making the assumption that although people should fold a King there when we shove, or at least I think they should, because what am I possibly cold calling with and calling the flop with and then like just ripping the river? There just aren't really any hands in my range here. Like I either have pocket nines or pocket tens like all the time basically. Sevens is probably like less likely, and maybe they don't expect me to cold call that hand free or whatever, but yeah. I don't know, raising flops like maybe kind of interesting. Like I think calling flop looks pretty strong as well, but at least by calling flop, like I think we do still have a range that has hands like nines, tens, etc. in it, so it must be best. Yeah, it definitely has to be best just to keep our range consistent there. Unless you want to have some strategy of having like a bluff range in that flop, which just seems like Absurd because people have King X so often there, it just can't be a good idea unless we think they're capable of hero folds and 3-bit pots, which I definitely don't think they are. Okay, it's tearing up the carpet, so it's going to have to be released from the room. Um, Ace-8 is a bit strong for me to want to 3-bet, even against the 3x sizing. I feel like snap check, so we just snap bet. Again, here I don't want to like let him check fold this flop an absurd amount and then be able to like pick up in the turn when I check back. Like we just want to bet. People just give the pot to you too much in these situations. They don't balance their checking range enough. Um which is definitely one thing I've learned. Like when I like you saw me check raise that board before I'm balancing my my checking range there because I know I need to check fold that Queen XX board. Um hijack versus but I know whatever it was fair amount. Um I just want to basically protect myself in that situation. This guy is like close to some kind of non-reg. He's six table and he's not hidden from search. I think he probably is a reg, so I'm going to stick to my tightest 3x strategy from the small blind. Um, but I guess it's kind of, kind of close to being an open. It just depends what kind of player type it is. If he's actually just someone who's playing passively, straightforwardly, etc, etc, then for sure I'll go ahead and um, open up there. So easy 3-bet here, easy 3-bet three three bet fold strategy against the fish. Like It's a big mistake to flat in that spot, but I see people do it all the time. Um, the reason it's a big mistake to flat is that the fish is usually just going to be continuing super, super wide with his um, opening range. Usually he's opening wide and just never really folding to 3-bets. This is one who obviously does fold to 3-bets, but most of them are opening super wide, they're not going away when they get 3 bet. so you want to get them to yourself in position. You don't want to see the flop three way because for one there's just less chance you can win the pot three way um, because another reg can come and make a better hand or whatever and secondly and you don't have enough fold equity three way like your fold equity goes down so when you miss the flop like part of the success of our isolation three bet there much like when we isolate an open is that we are able to see bet a bunch and just get folds when villains weak range misses the flop if we allow other people into the pot like we just don't win the pot anywhere near as much and we don't build a pot from we flop top pair which is essentially the nuts against such a guy so that is just a spot where opening is like completely mandatory sorry but isolating is completely mandatory this guy could even turn out to be some kind of like bad splashy reg i guess like from that open sizing i think it's kind of bad to 2.5x under the gun. I don't really see the merit in it, especially with like another fish at the table, but I don't know. I'm going to assume he's a fish for now. Um, so yeah, fairly eventful little session. Some important spots for range construction came up, which is kind of what we're going for in this series. So that's nice. I'm going to review that jack's hand. Like whenever like I'm not happy about a spot, but I feel like I'm have to make X play, I always sort of look at it later and think, do I have to make X play? Uh, do I have to shove the turn? Um, but yeah, I think against like a fish with such depolarized range, like it's probably best because I'm 
better than 50% against its color range there, I think. But why don't we... Um, I think it's an interesting hand to review, so maybe we can stop the video and actually just stove a bit of a range now. We'll do a little hand history review and then we'll wrap it up from there. Um, first though, we'll go ahead and open here. Um, usually I'm 2x in the button, I'm 2.5x in this one because the small blind is fairly collie and is a fish and the big blind is not like crazy with this 3 betting or anything. It's 9%, it's not the worst, it could be worse. Um, yeah, this is good enough for me to open when I don't when I have two guys who are folding their blind. Full big blind to steal is this stack eighteen seventy, and that's against men opens largely because that's how these stakes play. So this guy just folds his big blind way too much. It's one of his strategic leaks. Like seventy percent fold to steal when people are men opening. I think is just too high. So against two guys like this, seventy percent and eighty percent. Um, so there's like a seventy percent chance that the first guy folds, then there's a thirty percent chance he doesn't fold basically. So we can like work out um, how often that's actually going to get through. And we can do it this way. So let me just set out and then we'll do all of these things in just a second. So this is pretty easy. And just save time and go 70% full to steal, 80% full to steal. So there's a 56% chance that both of those guys are going to be folding there. We just times the percentages together. 70% um, times 80%. So the 56% chance that they're going to fold. I, I kind of know my 7 times table. I kind of probably could have done that without the help of the calculator, but oh well. So if they're both going to fold 56% and we're risking 2 to win like a pot of 150, like that's close to just being auto profit. And remember that we don't like lose the pot every single time that they call, we can still see bet. And if we play sensibly post flop and don't see bet too much and play selectively, then we need them to fold even less than that. So definitely going to be an open with any two cards from mid open in that spot. <clears throat> okay, let's go into stove poker cruncher. And we'll reset these ranges because I've saved them anyway. Good idea when you make ranges, by the way, to save them so you can do like future review and stuff like that. Ace Jack here against a guy who, I don't know, he appears to be some kind of fish actually. I had him tagged as like a tight rag, but definitely appears to be some kind of fish. What's he opening? Eh, it's fairly wide across the board. Um, this is kind of close between like all three options. Like I think calling is my least favorite option here. I'm gonna three bet um, for isolation purposes, basically. I think that a lot of fish are opening that range that Ace Jack does fine against here. I'm definitely like going to be folding to a four bet for sure against this kind of player. Never seen him before. Kind of fishy stats. Three xing. Nah. Most likely a fish, I would say. And he just folds, so no harm done, I guess. That's the other thing, like, even if he's not calling three bets loads in a vacuum, it's gonna be fine to just like have a three bit bluff range there. So we don't know. So Ace Jack is either gonna be like an okay three bit bluff if he is folding, even though it's not like optimal from a hand selection point of view, or it's gonna be like a good three bet for value if he's not folding. So definitely don't want to fold there when we can three bet and be plus EV either way, I think. And this is a spot where I'm going to 3x the cutoff because I've got this guy in the big blind and I've got two guys who are not too 3 bit happy to act after me, so I don't need to worry about protecting my open sides or anything like that. So, in that last hand, the board was something like, it's like 7, 5, 4 of rainbow variety, and then the turn we had like a 3 or something. Maybe it's a rainbow 3, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. Okay, so. We have jacks and our opponent's range. So what does it look like, first of all? Well, pre-flop, when he calls the ISO, he limp calls, he doesn't have like all the over pairs, he doesn't, he's never got like queens through aces here or anything like that. Um, should I bring up the hand history just to remind you guys exactly what it was? Okay. Oh wow, I got the board right. It must be like photographic memory or something. So he limp calls here basically. Does he? No, he just flats out the small blind. So either way, probably doesn't have like the top over pairs here. Probably just got like pairs like maybe tens, nines, eights, maybe like jacks as one combo. Who cares? 
Usually we don't see aces through queens here. We will sometimes because it's a fish, but oh well. We've already seen him check raise before. That doesn't mean a whole lot, but it does mean that his range is probably a bit weaker um, than if we if this was the first time. So the reason I want to three bet here is because fish are usually depolarized in this spot. It's not a bad idea to like call here and like bluff catch if we know this guy's like one of these crazy bluff off his stack kind of fish. But this board can get pretty nasty for pocket jacks and we not only get put in some annoying situations in future streets when over cards come um, or a 6 or an 8 or a 3 comes or any of the cards that kind of suck for us or 7 that's even a really bad card. There's loads of bad cards for, for us here but on this flop we should be significantly ahead of his range and we can just stack off happily against like all the depolarized stuff that he's raising and not folding here. So that's definitely why we should 3 bet this flop. I think that's definitely best. Bluff catching, only good if our opponent is really out of line and we are com comfortable like calling down on most runouts because of that and he's likely to bluff most runouts. Here we don't really know but we do have a suspicion that most fish here are going to stack off pretty wide on his flop and Jax is going to be like a really strong hand against their range. So on the turn his range gets significantly stronger. Our equity goes down fairly dramatically against it but I still think it should be above 50% but we'll find out. So I'm going to say that he calls off turn with like the over pairs. And remember that just because even if we have less than 50% here, betting might still be the best line because we're doing worse if we check call and worse if we check fold. So like check folding a pot with all this dead money is definitely worse than getting in with 40% equity, for example. Similarly, check calling against a stronger range than he'd be calling with himself is much worse than just shoving. So shoving here, we don't need to have the 50% equity against villain's range. We just need to be doing like better than check calling or check folding. So just one of these spots where we're not really happy and we need to find the best line, basically. Okay, so 8s to 10s, let's say he calls off with these hands. Let's give him some sets, although I'm going to assume that... I'm just going to give him like one combo of sets because I'm going to assume that he just stacks off on the flop and he has a set most of the time. I'm also going to give him a7. I'm going to say he stacks off a hand like that. And I think a hand like 8-7 where he thinks he has like gut shot and pairs like the nuts here as well, as well as any 7x with a speed. Um, he certainly doesn't ever fold, like, all these hands with a spade are going to be auto stacks for us. So the spade turn's actually good, in a sense, for us, and it helps our equity the times he has these really bad 7x hands with a spade. Um, okay, then he can maybe have some 2-pair. I'm going to give him, like, I'll give him a 7-6, obviously he has that in his range. 2-pair, um, like, 7-5 he can have as well. And then I think he can have, like, some gut shots, like, ace-deuce, maybe. He has like a straight here sometimes. That he, if we're gonna be like really pessimistic here and give him like all the combos of straights that you could have here, um, flop straight, possible. I'll add it just to represent some more strong hands here. We're just gonna sort of estimate at this guy's range here. Um, so what else? I think that's like a reasonable sort of estimate. We've got some top pairs and over pairs that he stacks off with. We've got the straights that he stacks off with. Obviously, we need to give him sixes. And we need to give him some other six straight combinations here. Even if we can give him like a bunch of straights here, like this is just a really bad turn. Let's say a range like this, like what does our equity look like? Okay, so like 35% is not the best. Um, so it could be that like if we only have 35%, it should be noted that if villain shoved and we had this much equity, we would have to call basically because we just have too much, we've got like 36% equity there, we've got too much to fold given that's the size of the pot. Um, so check folding is definitely going to be like pretty bad I think here, um, just because Dylan can be stupid and just shove like anything in this spot, like being a fish, you have like pocket twos and just be like shipping here. Um, in fact he probably calls with pocket twos actually, that should be in his range as well. So you can actually make it like a little bit wider here, I wouldn't be surprised if a guy like just flatted a ship with a hand like that. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting spot because when we check, things are pretty bad as well because if we check call, we're arguably just doing something that's inferior to shoving because we're just putting money in against a stronger range basically and that doesn't really make much sense. So it's between check folding and shoving here and if we check fold, it's just like, I don't know, I think it's just a bit, a bit rubbish when we have enough equity to be able to, almost probably to be able to check call, definitely to be able to shove is better than check folding, 
especially if he's check if he's shoving some of these hands as well that we're doing well against. The only time that check folding could be better here is if Villain is going to check back all his sort of overpairs and seven x stuff and then be just shoving the nuts here or whatever. It depends what the river card is as well. Um, when I say check call and check fold, I guess what I mean is like on the river, are we like calling a shove? Um, so yeah, kind of close spot. I maybe got thought I had a bit more equity than I did at the time against his range, but anyway, I don't think it's I don't think it's too big a deal. Either way, I think it's kind of close. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that lively um, and the the study that came before it. I'm going to make some more episodes in this series. Coach Patchouli is going to be making a, turn, a return at some point as well, um, so stay tuned for that. And I'll see you guys on the next on the next episode of Study and Grind. Until then, good luck at the tables. Thanks for watching.